Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks, Sherry. We also want to thank Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects, both wild and managed, before they disappear. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9, with editor and guest co-host Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We have a great show lined up for you with uh, USDA ARSB researcher Dr. Jay Evans. But before, uh, hey, well, Kim, you've worked with Jay quite a bit, haven't you? Well, he wrote for us when I was running bee culture, and... Uh, he got started, he, he actually made the proposal to write a monthly column, and to get a USDA person to write a monthly column is always a trick, so I jumped yeah. on it. Um, and his columns, uh, his column is great. I really enjoy them. They're short, sweet, to the point. And, yeah. and you know what he did, don't you? He took, that, he took a bunch of his columns and he turned it into a book. So yeah, we're going to talk about his book and a bunch of other USDA stuff when he comes on. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, before we get to Jay, uh, we have a couple other things to talk about. We've received a couple emails to our questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com, and we thought we'd want to share them with the rest of our listeners. First, from Cindy Hogan, she writes that she really enjoys our podcast programs and guests, and she gives us five stars, Kim. And uh, and thanks a lot, Cindy. We enjoy making the podcast, and I'm grateful that you're listening and took the time to write. And Kim, you've you've got an email there, don't you? Yeah, we got we got another one to the from the to the same place, Jeff. It's from Anna Schosel, Schosel, and I'm probably mispronouncing your name, but um, it goes like this. She says, "I've been looking for a podcast to listen to for quite some time, and it made me so excited that of all the days and all the podcasts I've skimmed through, I found yours today. I really enjoyed the episode I listened uh, to, to today on Heroes to Hives. Remember that one, Jeff? We just oh yeah, we just yeah. did that one." I'm a pr- I am prior service, but I didn't see any combat, so it was nice to hear someone with a similar background and thought process doing so much good in the world with bees and vets. It hit a little extra close to home as I am in Missouri and was just talking to a counselor at the University of Missouri about taking different online classes to help my husband and I grow our business. This is all a bunch of rambles, and I, but I just wanted to tell you that I enjoyed your podcast and look, look forward to hearing a lot more. So That's really she, nice. She and her husband run uh, a farm called Galena Hollow and um, uh, Heroes, to, Heroes to Hives. It, it fit right in for her, so that's good. That's really good. And we, last week we were talking with Kirsten, and she mentioned that uh, Adam has uh, received a lot of feedback from from that interview, and uh, we're glad we're able to connect a lot of our uh, yes. vets with beekeeping programs. Yes, good, 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 good. We did yeah, a lot of work with the, with the vet programs when I was at Bee Culture, and Jerry's still doing them. Uh, we donate we donate books, and primarily we donate books and subscriptions to these programs that are organized enough to have a place to store them. And uh, it's uh, well, I can't think of anything better that we could be doing. I agree. I agree. It's a good job. Well done. All right. Well, thanks, Cindy and Anna. Let's uh, get to our talk with Dr. Jay Evans, USDA ARSB Lab. 
Hey, and we're here now with Dr. Jay Evans, uh, the research leader for the ARSB lab in Beltsville, Maryland. Welcome, Jay, to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thanks so much, Jeff and Kim. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's good to see you again, Jay. I think we've all been in the basement way too long <laughs> this, this spring. <laughs> well, uh, Jay, I was fortunate enough to get a copy of your brand new book, and I'd like to I'd like to talk about it a little bit. But first, will you introduce yourself for the people listening who don't know you as well as I do? Sure. Well, I, I'm uh, working for the USDA uh, in the Bee Research Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland, which has been a long-standing place for disease research and diagnostics uh, in the area for a hundred some years. So. It's been an honor to work there, and I've been been there about 20 years myself, and uh, working with a great team of researchers on viruses, mites, nosema, all the, the sort of bad actors in beekeeping, and then also <laughs> stresses from pesticides and nutrition, uh, forage, uh, incomplete forage and such as well. So we're, uh, our lab focus, among all the academic and USDA labs, we're really focused on managing colonies with, uh, with the genetics they come with. So we're trying to you know, look for solutions to reducing disease and the pressures of disease on beekeepers. How big is the team there in uh, Beltsville? Right, so the, yeah, we're, uh, as far as uh, our, our so-called uh, lifers or permanent federal employees, we're, we're <laughs> 14 people. Mm -hmm. um, there are six scientists, uh, one of whom, Dr. Anna Childers, is doing uh, computational biology, so genetics, genomics. And then the five, the rest of us, are doing um, uh, targeted research on diseases and threats. So, so, and then we're benefited by, by technicians and beekeepers who, of course, keep the place running and keep their experiments running. Very good. Well, I have to ask. I have to ask you. You are the folks that I send my B samples to when I think I've got a problem, right? We are. Yeah. So that's the, again. That's the the birth of this enterprise was really as a disease center um, back with Dr. White in the early 1900s, 1906, defining or uh, naming at least American fowl brood, which had been known, of course, by beekeepers. Uh, well, it seems like for millennia, even as a as a challenge to their bees, but he cultured it and named it as part of the Bureau of Entomology and the USDA uh, back when it was in the in the you know more prime real estate in downtown Washington, and then they moved out to the suburbs, and we <laughs> we we live in uh, we live and work in Maryland, so we're we're on a a 4,000 acre campus that's devoted to agricultural research. Um, cows, soybeans, kind of looks like the Midwest right here in the DC area. <laughs> and, the, and the Bee Lab's been a part of that for, for uh, in, this, in this site since the 1930s. And um, we're hoping to maintain that and hoping to you know, find solutions and help some of the challenges that beekeepers are facing. Well, uh, <clears throat> Interesting, interesting place to work. I've been there a couple times and uh, met a lot of your people. Uh, I've always been impressed. I, I mentioned earlier, and I'm, I'm going to come back to it again, what you do every day studying diseases and pests and stresses on honeybees, the title of your new book is Bee Optimism. It's got to be, <laughs> how did you get that title, going to work every day studying the problems of honeybees? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. Well, that was maybe suggested optimistically by a colleague. I think, uh, as as you know, Kim, because you helped instigate it. This these essays were were done as a column in Bee Culture magazine under your editorial lead, and it called "Found in Translation." So they're really, yeah, taking the good and the bad of what faces bees, but trying to look at how research is addressing um, challenges and also just illuminating what fascinating creatures we happen to all work with or uh, be worked on by, I guess, sometimes. But <laughs> there, uh, so the title, Bee Optimism, was, was uh, from a couple of those essays and just highlighting that, you know, for all the 
challenges for all the difficulties that beekeepers and bees and bees beyond honeybees are facing, uh, we're all still here. And so there's some good going on as well. And it's a, it's a beautiful trade as a, you know, in beekeeping, but it's also certainly a privilege to study them. Well, I've, uh, like I said, I've been through, I've been able to read your book uh, on the back. Marla Spivak talks about doing it in one sitting. And I also was able to do it in one sitting. It was just, it's, I have to, I use this, this term, it's a page turner. It was for me anyway. So uh, what I, what I'd like to do is you have like five sections in the book and there's several chapters in each section. And, and, and a couple of these sections I found uh, both illuminating and, and, entertaining and the first one is challenges and opportunities and you mentioned a whole bunch of things going on there do you want to just kind of explore that a little bit sure yeah i guess and those were essays um that are maybe the closest to home for projects at the lab in terms of disease and threats and parasites and um and then potential uh things coming down the pike so there's always a you know there's there's research is always uh by nature optimistic and so there have been discoveries recently that that can address those issues and a few of them are on mites as you might expect mm -hmm. um so uh challenges challenges that varroa faces or varroa presents to individual bees um these great discoveries uh, led uh, largely by a graduate student, Dr. now Dr. Samuel Ramsey from the University of Maryland. Uh, so he was working with Dennis Van Engelsdorp down there and, and um, patiently watching mites just kind of work their way around bees and dig in. And, and they did a really elegant set of experiments that, that kind of nailed down the... Uh, it, to me, they're, one of the explanations for why mites are so devastating, they're not, they're not a mosquito that's there kind of slurping out your blood. They're carving this kind of artesian well in the side of the bee's body, and they're scraping away and <laughs> chewing on organs and, you know, the fat body, which is actually a pretty complex uh, thing for bees. Uh, it's not just storage of, of of uh, resources, it's it's an organ that's actually doing stuff to help the bees, and so the mites are in there, uh, like a rasper, kind of scraping away at this material, and and that wasn't it was certainly wasn't appreciated by me, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of my colleagues who, you know, kind of saw the danger of varroa and moving around viruses and stuff, but you know, we were always like, well, but they're only taking you know a minute drop of blood from these bees, and you know, energetically, the bees, what, what, you know, there's not, it doesn't seem like that much harm. It's sort of, again, like a mosquito or a tick where it's the, the physical part that it's taking out isn't the harm. It's the, um, it's the disease they carry. And that's certainly true. But we also now realize that, that the damage and the responses of the bees to this, the actual form of feeding Varroa used is uh, is much greater than than any of us thought. It's 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 like a I don't want to say I mean, it's like a festering <laughs> sore on the bees <laughs> that they keep chewing on, and um, so the bees kind of devoting immune responses to that, and maybe at the expense of responding to other stuff, and then it's just a mess. So so his work uh, to me was a case of someone coming at an issue with fresh eyes and. Um, you know, reading some literature that was hinting that things weren't quite as 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 we all thought, but coming there with a new approach and a bunch of different approaches, I guess, to really solve that. So that that was a big breakthrough in mites. Um, and another one that I think still hasn't gotten that much much press, although we you know we talk. I, I've heard you guys talking with uh, Tom Rinderer on the Russian bees, and mm -hmm. so we've all seen success stories with. Um, successful breeding strategies for Varroa at the, you know, at the quantitative level, they, they ding down mite numbers pretty well over time. Uh, but there was a study uh, quite recently in France that they um, found, I think a viable, a sort of a single, you know, native gene in bees. This is not a, <laughs> a genetic modification. It's something that, that resistant bees were carrying, but that one protein being a bit different than than in other lines of bees seems to be enough to to quell reproduction in varroa. So, 
I think that that to me points, and they did use some tech stuff to you know to identify it to make sure they were just looking at one thing. Um, so it was a lab based thing in the end, as well as you know taking advantage of a of a of a resistant lineage of bees. But but I, I just think that that could be the ticket, something like that, where where you know there there is a one or two proteins that are kind of in this uh, this dance with the mites somehow and if uh if they can be bred out of the bees or you know the 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 variation that's that's resistant is is maintained somehow uh that seems like a good good way forward so i don't know i I think the varroa (laughs) i know i think others others have declared victory against Varroa in the past too, I guess, or that we're <laughs> getting close to a resistant bee. But I, I do think there's, there's so much promise right now with, um, and especially in this suppression of reproduction trait, you know, there's, there's sort of signals that, that mites have to pick up on to, to start their program. So I'm hopeful for that. I think everybody's hopeful for that. I was, uh, I was, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see how far that had gone. Uh, I know that uh, some of the uh, some of the chapters that you originally published in Bee Culture have been updated um, a little bit. So I, it wasn't the first time it, uh, it was the first time I've read some of this stuff. So it was good to read. You know, you had another subject in there on another chapter. The chapter's title is "Sweetness and Light," and you're talking about the problems and the issues with with honey going on. What is funky honey? <laughs> okay, well, it, you would know as a I'm sure judge over the years better than myself, but um, yeah, and again, this it, it maybe uh, I would say at least a third third of these essays are on topics that I had to read a lot about just to write a thousand words. You know, they were <laughs> new topics to me, and but things I was just curious about, and that had you know obviously have importance uh, to many others who have done the actual work so looking at honey um you know the 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 sort of aging properties of honey of course and and possible adverse effects on us or on the bees um was just i was just curious about that i guess and there's been some updates to that work recently where you know uh, be, besides sort of hmf and the sort of known entities that that are that are uh produced as honey as honey uh breaks down or 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 sits too long or is heated uh there are other traits there's other other things that go on we all know that it honey tends to get darker over time if 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 left to its own devices (laughs) uh, especially in in light and so i was just curious about how that you know the chemics chemistry i guess behind that and more importantly if we're going to get ourselves sick by eating our old honey (laughs) well let's hope not uh, let's hope not. The, the other thing in in that chapter of sweetness and light is you talked a lot about propolis. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean that's another beautiful story that the bees give to us, right? They, they, they have been known um, sometimes uh, to the dismay of beekeepers to bring back, back plant resins, you know, wherever they live, whether it's Brazil or the U.S. or Europe, and so. Um, Again, Marla Spivak did sort of groundbreaking work to kind of look at the chemistries of different propolis, uh, different resins that are brought back from the bees in the form of propolis, and then to say, well, if they're doing this, you know, can we listen to them? Can we trust them? And it's it's sort of part of a general appreciation of of um, not just bees or not just honeybees, but but other animals as well, and this idea that you know. Uh, I always think of it as like your dog going out to eat grass when their stomach is upset, you know, or something like that, where you think maybe they know something, you know, and they probably do because they've (laughs) had to get over different bugs for millennia and bees um, naturally go out and get propolis and they're in honeybees. At least it's not used as much to kind of to gum up the entrance of the hive. Like some of the Brazilian bees might use it as a, as a, as a barrier for ants and other predators, honeybees um, just seem to spread it around inside. And, and so Marla's great insight and, and um, you know, many research projects were on that 
layer of propolis, that envelope, as it were, around the hive being antimicrobial, which it was known, those properties have been known for some time, uh, that maybe, you know, the bees are doing this and, and some bees do it better than others. Uh, but maybe beekeepers could modify their hives to, to favor propolis co collection and storage. So, so I just think that's another one where, again, the, the answer was there from the bees for a long time, but, um, with some really nice experiments, uh, she and her students were able to show that that it actually does seem to reduce the kind of the the, the, the stress of 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 microbes. And you know, my, microbes are opportunists. They're they're in that we can't avoid them, <laughs> whether they're viruses or bacteria. Um, but the the lower their numbers and the less likely the really bad actors are exposed to us. Um, the better off in terms of health. And so, you know, maybe if knocking them back by half uh, helps bees in a lot of ways. Talking to uh, Tom Seeley a while ago, we were we mentioned that when he was looking at uh, bees' choice of cavities to live in, and, and of course, the inside of a tree is rough and splintered and, and f ugly to the to the touch, but it makes it's an ideal location to to build that propolis envelope on, uh, and then they've got the bottom of that cavity, which is which they cover with propolis, and it's able to collect water in the winter, so they don't have they don't have to go out and collect uh, collect water in the winter. So, I think you're exactly right. The bees are trying to tell us something, and and maybe it's time we started listening. There's an old saying. I'm sure you've heard it. If it's good for the beekeeper, it's probably not good for the bees. And I think this is a good example of that. Uh, no propolis between hive bodies is good for the beekeeper, but the bees are trying to tell you something. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a, there was a, um, uh, the next section you were talking about queens. And and the the, the section title was Royal Decrees, and and you had some good information on replacement queens. Yeah, and I guess and the practical uh, output of that research is is um, you know looking at especially if you're a queen breeder, even if you're doing it for your neighbors or county or bee club, um, there's really good evidence that the the net hive nutrition and the structure of nurse bees and such, we know it affects uh, growth of the colony and the numbers of bees that come out, but uh, it also seems to very directly correlate with queen weights and, you know, some of the positive traits of, of queens. So I think those who are, um, you know, kind of focused on that as a, as a side income or even the big breeders uh, have to pay attention to this work and think, well, are my, are my, cell builder colonies nutritionally sound are they getting enough protein are they really ready to go so that there's some nice careful experiments that folks have done recently on that on that question well i uh enjoyed the i enjoyed the chapter it'll be interesting to see where some of that work goes and if it's it's able to make queen production queens are tough queens are you know queens are i'm not going to say queens are a problem but they're certainly they're certainly involved in a lot that goes on in the hive, and a, a queen that isn't 110% is a colony that's not 110%. So, you know, we recently uh, had a, a long talk with Chip Taylor about his Monarch Watch program, and and at the end of at the end of the discussion, he brought up a subject that, for reasons, uh, it never dawned on me. Jeff, you remember his talk on climate change and what it's doing to monarchs? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was impressive, and it kind of really mirrors uh, the same thing we've heard from other speakers. Jonathan Lundgren, for one, talking about uh, climate change and and the its impact on on uh, the forages, forage crops, and growing seasons, and everything else. It's um, it uh, and and you touch on that also in your in your book about the climate change and the impact. Yeah, on a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess part of this is bees are not, you know, thank goodness, maintained on artificial feeds for long. They are as a necessity in some cases, maybe maybe too much, but uh, I, I mean, they can be, but um, they're they're a reflection of the forage that's around them. So, uh, and we all know from just 
year to year variation. If it's a drought year, um, or, you know, maybe the conditions aren't great in the spring here in, here in Maryland, the, the, the honey, the nectar flow is, is kind of done by now, right? <laughs> We're in the tail ends of it. And this year was fantastic, but the last couple of years, for whatever reason, there just hasn't been the right mix of maybe foraging weather, but also just the, the trees haven't hung on as long. And, um, so I guess at the, at the current climate level, uh, just knowing that, um, knowing, uh, being able to predict based on what the weather patterns have been and maybe are projected for a season, um, beekeepers or, or honey vendors for that matter can have a better sense of what the yields will be when the honey's finally pulled off and extracted. And the, the one paper in there that I thought was interesting was from Austria and sort of like the U.S., I mean, they're really obsessed with, um, you know, kind of hive productivity and reports from beekeepers on, on what they extracted and where down to the, uh, you know, really down to the spot almost, down to the apiary level. And they did lots of data. I think it was 10 years or so of data and then gave it to some computer scientists and kind of chunked through to see what was the best predictor, uh, not just of honey yield, but of actual survivorship. And they had a, it was a combination of sort of wet winters, you know, this is year round. So it wasn't just the forage, but you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, kind of bad combos to help, um, uh, increased winter losses were really striking. They came out of those studies because they had so much data and, and multiple years of climate to sort it all out. And, and so again, that, that knowing the problem, if, yeah, again, I think, I think moisture at the wrong time in winter was one of them. Knowing that problem, a beekeeper might be able to preempt the, the damages from it. Maybe they would they would, you know, add a winter feed or they would, you know, you can't really move to Italy in the middle of winter or something, but <laughs> they could, they could try at least to, uh, to reduce the impacts of some of those climate effects. Um, and we'll see again, as the, as the climate changes, uh, maybe those will become more pronounced. Uh, honeybees, as I, I think I mentioned there as well, and is well known to, to beekeepers, uh, you know, live at some of the most extreme climates on the planet, right? <laughs> they can live in the tropics, they can live in Alaska and North America and Northern Canada. So, so as a species, they're super resilient, but the plants they rely on are, are the limiting factor in that case. And if there's a drought or a sustained drought or an increasing drought, you know, as, as the climate changes, um, there simply won't be as many bees in those habitats. They, they don't provide enough food for the bees or the right conditions. One of the things uh, that those people from uh, Austria that meant, were looking at you mentioned was, was a lot of colonies over a long time, years and years and years, they followed these colonies. And the longer they followed them, the less they were able to predict what was going to happen, it seemed. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's a sad truth, as you know from any from any science. Is like your your first year of results is often the most striking, and then you <laughs> try like heck to repeat it. And sometimes <laughs> it's, the world gets more complex as time goes by. But I, I think they did. You know, it's a it's a complicated model for how you know things that that affect bees. But I think they needed, of course, those multiple years to to not get the wrong answer. And I think they were actually getting towards a, a right, a right ish, at least answer toward the end where, where they could predict it. But that's, that's true. I mean, the, the U S has some great long-term databases, the uh, USDA, our, you know, national agricultural statistics service has long-term data on honey, and honey yields and colony numbers. Uh, the informed partnership is, has really hit the ground with some, you know, careful measurements of that. Um, uh, and then I also uh, like to highlight because it's just the brand new kid on the block, but this um, project Beescape that that uh, was started at Penn State University is really putting out. Um, I think they've just expanded outside of Pennsylvania to much of the country, and and you know, just putting out this kind of fine scale, you know, taking advantage of all these. Uh, I guess they're taxpayer funded monitoring of crops of climate and and you know satellite data for climate all that stuff that's uh that's really just you know gone from maybe a state level 
rain report to down to the, not quite your backyard, but pretty darn close. So they, they're they taking advantage of that information and kind of presenting, um, you know, again, it'll it'll take time to, to really resolve it, but they're presenting a view, you know, from the sky, as it were, of, of how well bees in your apiary might do over time. Yeah, Jeff, I have to I have to tell you this. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, they were looking at was uh, uh, crops in Iowa, primarily corn and soybeans, and and, and some of that. Uh, Jay brought up some work that I did about forty years ago on <laughs> on uh, soybeans. I, I think the I think the term was a much younger Kim Flottam, which you hit it pretty <laughs> close on the head. <laughs> So, yeah, that well, your work that work was 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 groundbreaking, and I know it's uh, th- there's active uh, work uh, in industry, you know, kind of work pushing for that right now, and that, that soybeans are <laughs> they're they're next to corn, you know, our, our dominant landform, as they say, <laughs> for the U.S. and much of our country. I mean, as a as a as a homogeneous plant. Um, so, and your, your work, and I think we, we also talked, uh, informally that you'd seen signs that there were, you know, kind of signals that around beehives, there was a better yield for soybeans. Um, of course it depends on the, the variety of soybean and the, and such, but yeah, that's another case of, you know, I know there's, there's an inherent, uh, uh, risk in some sense for the, for crops that are, that bees might come to if, if um, crop protection, you know, products are used on them, for example. Uh, but a huge potential if if the growers can see that the bees are, you know, markedly improving their yields, um, there, there's another chance for, for a partnership there and, and a way to help both sides. I don't know, I don't know if you know this, Jeff. Uh, my work in school was in horticulture. I was a grower. Yeah. Yeah. I have 10 green fingers. <laughs> uh, but when I got done, I was looking for a job, and I was Dr. Eric Erickson was running the bee lab there in Madison, Wisconsin. And right about the time I got done, he was looking for somebody to grow things, and I was looking for a job. So uh, it worked out real well. And part of the deal was, uh, after I came in, he said, oh, by the way, you're going to have to be a beekeeper because you're part of, the, part of the team here. And I knew... I've been around bees quite a while, but I'd never, never opened a hive. Just, I was just watching the people that did. So he and one of his uh, people took me out to a beehive and they opened it up and I've never looked back. So there's a lot of stuff with that story, uh, Jay, that uh, is fun to tell because uh, it, changed, it certainly changed what I'm doing for a living. So <clears throat> was that the research um, that you were uh, noticed that the, the pollination of the soybean was greater around the, the, the the post or the the yeah uh, yep telephone pole sorry or the chair telephone pole we did it we did it for several years we would put uh, folding chairs out in the middle of soybean fields and then we'd measure yield going out from the from the chairs and the farther away you went the lower the yield went I mean it was it was day and night clear that wow. that if the, if bees had a had a landmark in a soybean field that's where they'd go and when they went there they would uh, visit the flowers and increase the yield. So it was, it was, it was just, it was plainly obvious to us at the time, but I don't think it ever really picked up. So what are you going to do? Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Keep, uh, keep advertising that, that <laughs> science because it, you know, again, it could, it could change things up pretty much if that's works for today's soybeans. You were right. It, uh, it had to do with the variety. We tested out oh, hundreds of varieties that were available then, and I'm sure there's a lot more now, but it was very obvious. We looked at uh, nutrients, and we looked at temperature, and we looked at soil moisture, and we looked at um, um, variety, and variety was the main the main factor in terms of yield. But uh, <clears throat> there's one one more thing you that I want. Well, two more things I want to talk about because this is one that close to my beekeeping is overwintering. You have a lot to say about overwintering. Right, yeah. Well, people, scientists have had a lot to say, as of beekeepers, the last few years on overwintering. And I guess um, the, the big uh, 
not brand new, of course, in the northern parts, but the, the big uh, change that's gotten the most interest lately is, you know, these sort of controlled settings of uh, an Apple storage facility or, a, you know, a, a, a starting with very passive, you know, just, just slightly uh, protected uh, uh, warehouses for bees. And it, that's become a real science with the beekeepers regulating CO2 directly, maybe increasing, maybe decreasing. Um, and there's talk of, you know, kind of narcotizing the bees so they don't burn through much, so much honey during the winter. So not only is the temperature moderation reducing honey needs, but, you know, maybe the bees are sort of sleeping. They're going into a, a, a beekeeper induced, you know, not a hibernation because they don't really hibernate, but a, a slower life, as I say. And, and all of that has come out. I think there's beekeepers who have been pushing that research on their own. I mean, they're doing, they're trying it because they, they'd heard a story or two. And, but the stories, uh, the, the, the one from, our, our USDA colleagues in Arizona uh, looking at, you know, kind of the nutrition and the, the, um, the benefits of possibly doing this. And they're still continuing that work down there. Uh, I think could be real advice for beekeepers, you know, maybe, maybe this is, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't, hopefully we won't have 80% of our bees in, in, warehouses every winter but but a, a sizable fraction it might be a safer way to get them through winter and then ready to go in february for pollination one of the things that uh, came out of that chapter and then i folded it into some of the other information you talked twice you talked about the num number of surveys that are being taken now and the huge mass of data that people are collecting uh, the BIP people, the pollinator two people with their mitothon. Uh, there's another one out there. Um, Colas is another group that's that's looking. At, you came up with a you came up with a phrase that I I I had to write it down because it made so much sense. He says um, signals in the noise was was that's what people are beginning you have so much data you're being able to you're being able to see trends and and results and all of these things but that that phrase signals in the noise really struck home yeah well and partly it's you know bees aren't um not to disparage other animals but they aren't cows or sheep <laughs> where you know they that's pretty predictable when they start to get sick like there's so many things that can go right or wrong for a beehive uh, or an apiary for that matter and so we really can't get a handle on what brought down a, 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 an apiary for example without long-running experiments like they're doing uh, and and lots of data the the other thing and this is this is a topic that i probably spun off on a bit too much in a sense but it was because it was so fascinating to me is that lots of people are doing these um, hive monitoring devices as well as tagging individual bees at the, in the hundreds and hundreds. And the, you know, I talked about the, you know, these sort of middle-aged bees that maybe were exposed to pesticides or maybe were exposed to a virus threat. And they're getting out there and they're, they're not, you know, they're not dying on the doorstep. They're going and doing a few foraging trips, but they're doing half as many maybe as they, they might have as it controls to. And, all of that's enabled by, you know, it's just too, it's too hard and too expensive to have students or let alone the PIs, you know, sitting in their folding chairs outside the hive. So <laughs> they, they attach these little stickers on the bees that with RF, RFID tags and the bees come back and say what they did all day. And, and those studies are really, really shaking up um, what's going on They're They're actually being used now with observation hives. There's a, a a study that I haven't um, written about, but it's it's just came out this year from uh, the University of Illinois and, and Iowa State, where they've they got a nice, a, a typical kind of two dimensional observation hive, pretty pretty narrow, just the glass. Uh, well, the glass and the uh, the bees are kind of forced into an, 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 an a visible area, <laughs> a single sided, no frame in the middle. And they have tagged every single bee. So it's in the thousands of bees at, by the end of these studies. And I you know how that, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of super glue, but they, <laughs> they each bee's tag 
is unique. So they have a unique signal on those tags and they can, they can follow all their interactions. And this study from the group, um, this group at Illinois was looking at that virus infection and, and this idea that, you know, are bees, are the bees shunned when they're sick or are they, are they, uh, embraced as it were <laughs> and sort of, uh, but, but you can't, get enough sort of single bee observations to study that. I mean, and I think a lot of us were keen on that, like, you know, SEMA or viruses, does it make bees, uh, you know, feed each other more or, or that or, or, or avoid each other? And, and they were able to do it really because they, they could measure hundreds and hundreds of interactions, thousands of interactions between bees. And, and that's, just, that's funny. And it's behavior, right? It's, it's something that it's not, you're not making robot bees, which are, kind of a sad expression of our interest in bees, but you're, <laughs> you've got regular real life bees doing their thing and they probably don't know they have the sticker on their back. So they're just doing their regular behavior. And the main difference is we just, we just see them in a way that we've never seen before. Just a lot more detail. I can't imagine coming to work with that hive one morning and seeing two stickers laying on the bottom of the hive. Which two did I lose? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, but, you know, you would know because those stickers would not show up for roll call. Yep. <laughs> so the, yep. Actually, I was kind of thinking the other way, Kim. I was thinking, come into work one morning with, and someone hand you a box of all these little stickers and they say, okay, see that observation hive over there? I want you to put <laughs> one of these on each bee. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And yeah. then, then tomorrow you'll do the Africanized hive. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, right. <laughs> I, th I think I'm looking for another job. Um, <laughs> well, what, the title of the book is Be Optimism. What are some of the things we have to be optimistic about, Jay? Well, I think all of those, in terms of the research, you know, we, we have great tools, uh, a lot of, lot of fresh minds coming in. I mean, you know, I think almost as a rule, every study I wrote about is by someone younger and <laughs> younger and smarter than myself. So there's a lot of people coming into the field and a lot of um, students who are passionate for bees, uh, passionate for beekeeping. And, I, and you, you've engendered through, through bee culture and what you guys are doing now, uh, the voices of a lot of these, you know, new beekeepers who are, are doing either changing the economics of it or doing media and, and such to, to teach others about bees, but it's, uh, so that's sort of, it's been exciting too. And of course, I just think the research is getting better and better. We're, we're able to do stuff that we couldn't do before, I guess. I think, uh, the, the, I think Tom Seeley made the word, but you used it, you used it, uh, the super organism and the colony level study, being able to look at how not an individual bee in the lab, but a colony in the field, and being able to work at that level and being successful, so I'm. It was, it was good to see that progress being made um, more and more and better and better. I think so. <clears throat> like I said, Jeff, it's a good book. When you get time, uh, sit down and and uh, you can read it in one evening. It's it's that good. I you won't be able to put it down. Yeah, I have been working through it. Honestly, well, yeah, yeah, it's a great book. I've really been enjoying it, and and I. I found all of it very fascinating. The part that I really liked, and I liked it, that you did end on the two chapters of the be optimism. And, and I think that's maybe just a sign of the times or anything, but it was a great way to end the book um, and just kind of think and, and come back to the positive things. A lot of the research can focus, uh, a lot of times a lot of discussion on everything can often lead to a, a, a negative view of things or the problems facing one self or uh, the bees or whatever, but to come back and, and recap well look, and put the positive spin on it and look at the half half full aspect of it is, I like that. That's good. So kudos to you, Jay. It was good. So what what's the USDA bee lab in Beltsville, Maryland up to as soon as you get out of lockdown? Well, <laughs> the scientists, uh, being scientists, they're sneaking in already. They're trying to, they're being safe and uh, doing the field. We've got um, really three uh, uh, primarily field oriented scientists there right now. Um, uh, Dr. Stephen Cook is really tracking down miticides. So he's up to the point of some small scale field trials with novel miticides, but also looking at mite behavior and some other traits in the lab. And that's, 
that's exciting. I mean, I think he's, you know, he's got a good mix of, of kind of indoor skills and, and these sort of field colonies. So we've got that going on. Um, and uh, Miguel Corona, Dr. Corona is doing some nutrition supplement work and, and his interest in niche right now is, is uh, seasonal diets perhaps or else just the sort of ways that, you know, a lot of the work for, for say pollen supplements, protein supplements has been, um, you know, focused on, on large, on sort of industrial beekeeping and, and large scale thing, which is fantastic to get them ready for, you know, spring, spring buildup. But the, uh, you know, there's, there's a, there's a possibility at least to look at how a late season supplement might get your bees through winter at a higher rate, things like that. So, but so those two, and and actually, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Albaraki is a is a new hire at the lab. He's looking also at kind of queen and colony health, which is which uh, you know we we had uh, not been doing so much over the last few years, and it's such a huge and important topic. And and so those three uh, were given a variance by uh, <laughs> up the up the the food chain, as it were, for USDA, because they're seasonal projects. We can't afford to stop those for a whole year. So they've been almost continuously out, you know, getting spring um, splits going to set up those experiments and starting all those trials uh, with a handful of helpers who are, you know, and they're they're very careful. Of course, they're not riding in the same truck. Or <laughs> uh, we wear masks when we're in the in the building all the time now, and, and things like that. So. So those are off and running. And then um, uh, uh, Dr. Judy Chan and myself on the sort of disease side of things, uh, we're, we're sneaking in less frequently, but also trying to get some stuff going. Um, and, and meanwhile, scientists, being scientists, we're all sort of sitting on rainy day kind of data sets. And so we're trying to churn through those as well and look for answers from things that, that had uh, been left on the computer from last year or, or <laughs> even to sadly some, sometimes several years ago. And so hoping to get some insights from those. Um, we are, yeah, we're in, and we're in sort of a phase one uh, of reentry to work on the campus. Um, and we're all hoping, you know, maybe September, August, September, we'll, we'll be back. Uh, our behaviors will be different. We'll have a, <laughs> probably still be wearing masks and and uh checking our temperatures and all the all the things all of you are doing but we'll we're we're really eager to get back you know kind of to make something of this year after the setbacks well it sounds good are you doing um disease diagnosis tests right now that people send in Good point. Yeah. So just this week, we are back to doing uh, brood diagnostics for fowl, the two fowl broods because that, you know, we realize that that's one thing that that's <laughs> that given a lapse in attention, we'll get many more cases of American fowl brood, for example. And we usually, you know, we confirm over 100 to 200 American fowl brood cases each year, uh, largely sent by state inspectors, but every once in a while, a beekeeper will sort of, you know, and they're allowed to send it directly, um, we'll send in a sample and we're like, oh, you know, we're going to, and, and, and we do, we do have to, you know, share the information with, with the state in those cases. But, um, so we, we realized that two months of spring checks and lots of brood and bees without any sort of backup to the inspectors for, for the brood diseases was, was too much. So we've started doing those again, uh, uh, Samuel Vaughn is coming in, uh, targeting those samples. So, so while we're not doing the mite counts or the seam accounts right now, we are um, able to take samples and process them if someone thinks they have a brood disease. Okay, well that's good. Yeah. That's that's good. That's an outstanding service you guys provide for uh, our industry. So uh, we appreciate it. What have we missed, Jay? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, let's, um, you know, again, I, I, I sort of mentioned the, the, the new, new blood as it were in beekeeping and you've had many of them as writers at bee culture and, and on your show, but, um, it, it, yeah, science, uh, continues to, to kind of evolve and, you know, some of us make some of us become more indoor biologists than, than we used to be, but it, 
I, I really think there's a lot of, um, I guess, I guess I, I think of it more as teams. A lot of papers these days, and you'll notice that, Kim, from when you were when you were doing science research, it used to be, a, you know, a student and their advisor, you know, so and so in Rothenbuehler, or so and so in Erickson, and uh, maybe a, maybe a handful of people. But the the really this paper I just mentioned on the social interactions of of bees, uh, I, there's at least ten people on that paper, and there there's you know the the person doing all the computer code and there's the beekeeper too and there's the the neurobiologist uh professor gene robinson was on there you know so this expert expert in in bee behavior and neurobiology but but not someone who's you know who's sought out work on disease before so and then the disease folks and the applied folks and so it, it's it's uh yeah right now any any project we do um you know i, I love working with people in in our lab but we also almost always work with people from other institutions, whether it's another USDA group or a lot of times with the universities nearby, the University of Maryland, for example. Um, and it's just fun. It's it's a different. It's it's <laughs> it, it sadly fa- it lends itself to Zoom calls, which we're all fully <laughs> sick of after the last three <laughs> months. But but if you can tolerate that and uh, build relationships that way, you know, it's kind of a new world for research. And it's I, I think it's been fun. I think it's been great to be able to, you know, kind of have everyone pull out their own bit of expertise and try to make a team out of it. And looking at some of the references you were reading, you see 10 people, four universities in three countries uh, <laughs> working together on projects. So um, that's good cooperation. I'm old enough that at least, you know, when I was a student, a grad student and stuff, you know, you used to still write uh, in a little postcard. You'd write to somebody in Serbia and ask them for a paper, and you were lucky to get it back in two or three months. And <laughs> from that, now, you know, we can... We can email them, and, and also, you know, for the most part, there are a lot of journals have um, many of them have free online access, which is, I think, a fantastic way forward. But a lot of them, you know, it's just so much easier to get information and to, to just talk to people. So that's been fun. Well, this was a great way to get information. Yep, Dr. Jay Evans with the USDA Beltsville B Lab. Thank you for being with us today. I hope uh, to hear from you again, and I'm going to get back to Beltsville someday. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we would love to see you too in person. So if you can (laughs) make it back, please do. And um, thanks so much. It's really fun uh, and honor to be on your podcast, but also great to see you too. Oh, good. Well, thank you for, for joining us. Our pleasure to have you with us. All right. Definitely. But take care. Be safe. You too. Well, I really enjoyed talking to Jay. He's uh, he's as as friendly and nice and in, in, in person as he seems in his articles and also in the book. Yeah, it was, and I, I, he straightened some things out that I was having a hard time understanding in the book. And he and and I hope the people listening today got an idea that, that he covers a lot of territory and not a lot of not a great big book. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's you can read it in one setting. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it is a good. I, I don't want to say an easy read because it makes it sound simple, but it does. It's easy to read and 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 enjoy. You don't have to yep. sit down and feel like you are opening a textbook. Yep, I enjoyed that. All right. Well, that wraps it up for this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. In fact, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram, too. Check us out there. Oh, and don't forget Facebook. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their sponsorship of Beekeeping Today podcast. And we also want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that about wraps it up for today, Jeff. Thanks. It was a good time. Very good. Thanks a lot, Kim. Take care.